welcome Pastor Israel Campbell from the Wave Church in Los Angeles. Awesome. Come on, lift up those hands towards heaven. Come on, lift up those hands towards heaven. Come on, would you say this with me? Would you say, Holy Spirit, I'm ready. I didn't come here by accident. I believe you ordained me this morning to have an encounter with you. I'm believing I came in one way, but I'm going to leave this way different. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. Why don't you high five three people? You can be seated. Such a privilege and honor to be here. Uh, many of you don't actually know the impact your pastors and your church have made on my wife and uh, our church. In fact, uh, for about 12 years ago, my wife and I had uh, youth pastored in Orlando, Florida. We were originally from the Seattle area. I was born in Los Angeles area, a Southern California baby. In fact, I was actually abandoned at nine months old. My parents had uh, biological parents dealt with addiction issues, got thrown in jail, and uh, I was left at a doorstep of a house nothing to my name except a bottle filled with coca-cola and a diaper rash and uh, uh, just to see the grace of God where I'm at today uh, and the journey uh, is just God's hand and grace but one of the most impactful times of our ministry life was uh, my wife and I moved to Wilson North Carolina anybody know where Wilson North Carolina is and uh, uh, when we moved there we had a dream and we had a dream and we just felt like God wanted us to have a church that looked like heaven and uh, looked like our city. And uh, everyone there told us it could not be done, said that because of some of the racial tensions of the past and just the way it was the South, they said it couldn't be done and uh, ran into a friend uh, named John Bevere who said, you need to go to Fayetteville. <laughs> You need to meet and meet these pastors that are my dear friends and go to this church. And I'll never forget, my wife and I, I think, uh, Pastor, we sat in the very back. I hadn't even met you. Sat in the back with a baseball cap and uh, just watched and saw the praise and worship and saw the people coming together. And uh, all of a sudden, hope came into us and said, you know what? We can have a church that looks like heaven uh, in Wilson, North Carolina. And, uh, and so your church had a major impact in us. Uh, we had multiple campuses, Wilson and Greenville, went and got billboards that said uh, laundry is the only thing that should be separated by color and uh, put those billboards out throughout our region. And uh, your church uh, was a place that helped us and the apostolic call on your pastors in your church. You didn't even know it, but you were making a difference uh, not only in a, a surrounding city, but uh, throughout the United States. Here we are today. Uh, we launched a church in Los Angeles almost two years ago, and it's amazing that same uh, attitude of having a church that looks like heaven we have in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I just believe uh, most of that, the majority of that, comes from the demonstration of God's love in this church. So thank you. Tell your neighbor, say, you got a friend in L.A. Come on. It's funny, Pastor, when I lived in Wilson, none of my friends came and visited me, and now that I've moved to L.A., everybody wants to visit. Uh, it's a funny... Uh, the other thing that's interesting, even this summer camp, is uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I, I believe I was asked to speak uh, in, in, in like Alabama with your kids and another church, Pastor Scott's church, and, and we went down, and it was the hottest camp I've ever been to in my life, uh, and... And uh, I brought with me a college student that was really going through a difficult time. And I just told him, just come with me to this camp. And I just believe God's going to speak to you. God's going to do something. And the power of God showed up at that camp during worship and ministry time. And that praise and worship leader today is actually now my brother-in-law. and or That college-age student is my brother-in-law and our church's worship leader. And it was all birthed. 
out of you guys. So we're connected more than you even think. So that is awesome. And my wife today is preaching for me in Los Angeles. My church gets happy when I'm gone because she is a better preacher than I am. And uh, they don't even miss me. But if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 24, verse 49. I ask Pastor... I asked uh, uh, Pastor Al how long I could preach, and he said you could preach the whole afternoon, but we all leave at 1230. (laughs) So Luke chapter 24, verse 49, I got to get into this. Luke 24, 49, in the English Standard Version, it reads this, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, clothed with power. How many of you would like to be clothed with power? Anybody like to be clothed with power? Come on, how many of you know clothed with the Holy Spirit is a lot better than clothed with Nike? Come on, clothed with Reeboks. How many of you would like to be clothed with the Holy Spirit? Amen? I love that. Jesus, here he is. Uh, uh, Ten days before Pentecost, the day he's about to ascend, begins to tell his disciples of anything that he could tell them doctrinally, of anything that he could tell them about the church and what would be good church growth strategies or what would be good as disciples what to do. The thing he told them is, hey, don't try to do anything unless you're clothed with the Holy Spirit. And gives us a perfect illustration of what that encounter with the Holy Spirit should look like and should feel like. It should be like in the morning getting dressed. Come on. It should be like in the morning. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, close us, empowers us to do what he said. And when Jesus said that word, clothed with power, this is not a new phrase that he is introducing to uh, Christians or Christ followers or those who knew the word of God. He's actually taking symbolism from the Old Testament because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit clothed Gideon. The Holy Spirit clothed Zechariah. The Holy Spirit clothed one of David's mighty men. So here's Jesus talking about the power of being clothed from on high by the Holy Spirit. Push your neighbor and say, clothed in power. Now push your second neighbor that's your second favorite. Push them and say, clothed in power. Come on. Now turn with me to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 through 19 in the New Living Translation says this. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year, his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for an incredible service already, incredible atmosphere of worship and freedom and an incredible atmosphere of hearing what your word says about generosity and giving. And now, God, we thank you for this opportunity to get into your word. We know that it's your word that that increases our faith, that renews our mind. The psalmist said, if we could put your word in our heart, it would keep us from sinning against you. So, God, we pray that this morning we would not simply be hearers of your word but we would also be doers of your word i pray that you would custom make custom tailor this message for every person in attendance and is listening so that it will directly affect what they're going through so that they can leave this place different than how they came in in jesus mighty name we pray come on somebody say amen Amen. i like this verse the bible says in the old testament that 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 Samuel's mother, Hannah, every year would make him a coat that was supposed to fit him for the year. I guess the reason why I like this story is uh, it reminds me of my childhood when I was 
13 years old, my parents, uh, who were pastors, were very frugal with money, very uh, uh, always trying to teach me the value of hard work and money. And uh, we always kind of lived in a neighborhood that we probably couldn't afford to live in, but they sacrificed to make sure that we were in a neighborhood that had good schools and good athletic programs and just different things. And so we would kind of get into the neighborhood, but uh, almost in a sense couldn't afford to be there. And uh, my parents, when I was 13, came to me and said, Israel, uh, it's your birthday, and we want to get you anything you want. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and they, then they added the caveat of whatever you get, uh, we'll match the money to buy. And so they weren't just going to give me anything. They were trying to teach me hard work and saving that whatever I wanted, if I wanted a skateboard or I wanted a bicycle, they would buy me for my birthday. And my present was that if I came up with half, they would pay the other half. (laughs) Come on. I'm teaching you some parents some lessons right now. We'll get rid of an entitlement generation right there with that alone. Uh, But... uh, so, so they taught me that, and, and, and you know how parents are, they talk you into it. I was like excited, like, what? Yeah. Oh, I'll pay for half my present? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I had a paper route that was once a week, one week, and it was a free newspaper, and they paid me $3 a week. $3 a week, and uh, of course my parents, when I would get that $3, would have an envelope for me, and I was supposed to put a dollar in there, and I would argue with my dad. I'm like, Dad, the tithe is only 30 cents. You know how much, you know, you know how many candy you can get with the other 70? And he's like, no, we got the building fund, we got offerings, we got missions. You put the whole dollar in, Israel. And, uh, and so I got $2 a week, and I saved and I saved and I saved. And uh, it came time for my birthday. And my parents were like, okay, you know, how, you, how much money did you save? And what are you going to buy? And, uh, and uh, they thought I was going to get a bike or a, a skateboard or something. And I said, I want a pair of Nike Air Jordans. <laughs> Come on, does anybody feel the will of God on that right there? <laughs> and my parents were appalled. They were almost like, what? You're going to pay $65 for a pair of shoes? And I'm like, nope, only half. (laughs) And, uh... Uh, and, and, and so even at 13, there was, there, there, I was wise beyond my years because I didn't get the shoe that actually fit me. I got a shoe size, two size bigger. And, and as I grew, I learned to clench my toes and I made those bad boys last for a long time. Not only did I buy the shoes that day, I also bought a toothbrush just for the Jordans. And uh, my parents were just like, why would you do this? But I'm telling you, when I put on those Jordans and I went to Briar Terrace Middle School, I am telling you, my level of influence increased. Come on. I was the skinniest kid in the school, but I had the coolest Jordans. Hallelujah. So I like this story. I like this story. It says that... uh, that, that, that Hannah uh, uh, every year would, would get a coat and uh, give it to Samuel. And I, I got some guys right here. I think maybe you guys would work. Come on up here. Come on up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, th- are those? Let, let, this, this is the store. Let me see them shoes right there. What, what, what size are those? Five. You know what? I've learned to clench my toes. They might fit. <laughs> So, so let's just let's just do this for a second. Uh, uh, we got we got young Samuel, right? Young Samuel, got young Samuel. Give it up for young Samuel. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then and then we know uh, that Samuel's gonna get bigger. Samuel's gonna get taller. Samuel Samuel's gonna yeah. Sam, Sam, Samuel, what what is that right there? Is that muscle? I don't have that thing right there. That's awesome. And so, so we got young Samuel, and the mom makes a coat that he's supposed to wear all year. So she comes, it's that day, it's that moment, she gets it on. Ah, 
as you can see, it's big, it's large, it's not for where he is currently, but prophetically she believes that he's not going to stay the same size, that he's actually going to grow, he's going to mature, and he's going to develop. I came all the way from Los Angeles to tell somebody right now that God sees where you're at, but the reason it seems overwhelming, and it seems big, and it seems large, and it seems like it doesn't fit, is because God sees your tomorrow, not just where you're at now. I think we're going to preach this morning. I, sometimes I feel like a teacher, but this morning I feel like we're going to preach. Don't you dare put a B3 up there or we're going to be in trouble. Here is a symbolism of the Holy Spirit seeing you and I having an encounter, having an appointment. But when the Holy Spirit has an encounter and an appointment with us, it's not just for where we're at, but it's for what we're about to go through, what we're about to face, what we're about to see. And I came to tell somebody, don't you dare get frustrated. Don't you dare start whining and crying crying and saying it doesn't fit there's a reason it doesn't fit and it's because the holy spirit sees where you're at and what he's about to do i wonder if we could just get a couple hundred folks that would in here begin to declare to god hallelujah thank you that where i'm at is not permanent but what you see is greater is bigger is huge come on somebody come on slap your neighbor and say where you're at is not permanent throughout the year Samuel grows how many of you ever had a teenager how many of you know overnight They'll go from five foot to seven three. The shoes you just bought them, the pants you just bought them, right? Samuels grow. We grow. We enlarge. Our vision enlarges. Our mentality for the Word of God enlarges. Our worldview enlarges. Our love enlarges. So the Holy Spirit sees <laughs> where we're at, but knows who we're going to become. <laughs> at one point in our christian walk one point this year one point when we're dealing with the power of the holy spirit there's going to be moments in ministry and in life and in marriage and in parenting that we're going to feel overwhelmed but there's going to be in the same cycle in the same season seasons that what used to fit no longer fits So, so, so my wife and I, we pastored for 10 years in Wilson and Greenville, North Carolina. We moved to Los Angeles. Now, in Wilson and Greenville, everyone's a Christian or everyone's a Baptist. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> we moved to L.A. And no one, it, it seems like no one's a Christian. And I saw the TV show, Preachers of L.A. I don't even know if they're Christians. I'm just saying. I'm just... And, 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 and so completely different world. Feeling 
as we, as we go to plant this church not knowing anything, leaving two campuses, leaving staff, leaving team, leaving a church that is growing and making a difference to a, a, a church plant that has nothing. We, we started in our backyard and, and, and we, don't, we don't even have a church copy machine. Just the other day, we got a shredder, Pastor Al, and I was like, Whoa! We're moving up! <laughs> we got a church shredder! <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a different season, and there's seasons that seem overwhelming. I used to have an off, I used to have, uh, we had this little place, it had color copiers. We, and you know what else? I had an assistant that would make the color copies. Now I'm at FedEx making copies. And they're all upside down. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and so overwhelmed. Uh, the week we moved to Los Angeles to launch the church, my wife's uh, mother, who had been battling cancer, died of cancer. Two months later, her mother and, or her grandfather and her grandmother died. In the span of two years, Rachel lost her mom, her dad, two sisters, her grandma, and her grandpa. And here we're supposed to start a church. Ken and Barbie. <laughs> Overwhelmed with how big the city was. Overwhelmed with, with can we do this? Do, do, do you know, we, we could preach in, in Wilson and they, they'd say, preach it, white boy. What are they going to say in L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> Overwhelmed by, are we qualified? Uh, can we do this? I remember the first service, we set out chairs, and, and, and in L.A., nobody comes to anything on time. And it was five minutes till the service, and we had more people on the platform than we did in the chairs. And I was like, I left what? <laughs> I felt overwhelmed. But I came to tell you that the Holy Spirit sees where you're at. And he wants it to be bigger. He wants it to feel like you can't do it. He wants it to feel like you can't do it on your own. Because if you think you can do it on your own. And you think you've got the call. And you've got the gift. And that you're the best thing since sliced bread. You're going to be in big trouble. But when you're overwhelmed. And you feel like there's no way you can fit into this. Then all of a sudden your attitude and your mindset changes changes you begin to say holy spirit i could never do this without you holy spirit i can't do this unless you show up i wonder if there's anybody here this morning that would say with me holy spirit come on i can't do this on my own the call is too big the job is too big the assignment is too big the prophetic word is too big what you've declared over me is too big and i can't do it on my own i feel overwhelmed and underqualified but holy spirit i believe that you've ordained my moment you've ordained this time and I was born for such a time as this and it may seem huge but I trust you point to your neighbor and say tailor made so we got somebody feeling overwhelmed then we got Samuel growing up and all of a sudden Samuel's feeling kind of constrained what 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 used to fit what used to be big is now constraining. What, what, what used to work doesn't work anymore. Come on, if you're still using a typewriter for your business, if you're still doing Morse code, you're going to be in trouble in today's tech society. But as the church, we think that's just the world when the Holy Spirit says, come on, my mercies are new every morning. And if you've only had an encounter with the Holy Ghost in 1972, you're missing out because the Holy Spirit wants to do something fresh and something new. And maybe you're feeling constrained, not by the enemy, but constrained because you're still holding on to what happened three years ago when God wants to do something fresh and do something new this morning. I'm not talking about last Last week, I'm not talking about last year. I'm talking about His mercies are new every morning. I wonder if we came this morning with an expectation, an attitude, and a heart that said, Holy Spirit, I need a fresh touch. I, 
I felt that constraint. We, 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 we went through this season of overwhelming, and, and it was, we, we, we got the truck, and we got the equipment, and we, 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 we started, and we did set up and tear down. And, and just a few months into that set up and tear down, uh, 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 a pastor came and wanted to take me to lunch. And, and, and when you don't know anybody, and you're planting a church, you'll eat with anyone. <laughs> I didn't know if it was a Jehovah Witness. Didn't know. Just like, come on. Uh, uh, I'll take a free meal, man. Pray with you afterwards. And, and and so we go out to eat and 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 we you know converse a little. And on the way out, he says, "Hey, um, here's the situation. Our church has a building, but we're not growing. And so we wanted to know if you would want to take over our Sunday mornings, and 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 then we'll move our service to Sunday night. And uh, and 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 you can put." all your equipment and you never have to set up and tear down we'll just borrow your equipment so we took down their stuff put our stuff up all the background all the lights all the audio all the stuff so we never had to set up or tear down again they had the chairs so we did, we we got out of the box truck so all of a sudden like I'm calling my friends that have church planted yeah 3 months in we got a building <laughs> And they're like hating me because they're still setting up and tearing down. And I'm like, favor, 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 come on. And, 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 uh, 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 but then all of a sudden we just kind of started running into some issues, just some difficulties. Just didn't seem like it was flowing like it used to. And immediately I was like, man, this, these are, these are, these are LA demons coming against us. That, that Botox demon of LA. I know it. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> Lucifer venom in their foreheads. I know it. <laughs> and 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 uh, believe me, the enemy does come to kill, steal, and destroy. But I felt like the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, Israel, the reason why you're constricted, the reason why it's difficult, the reason why you're not feeling the, the ability to do what you're called to do is because you're still operating in your North Carolina anointing and still talking about what worked in North Carolina. But this is Los Angeles and what worked in North Carolina. Come on, pig picking don't work in L.A. when all they eat is kale. And, 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 and so the Holy Spirit began to deal with me. Is, it was my prayer life and my, my, my devotion life and all of that. I was pulling from the well of yesterday. But if I was going to be successful in this new season, I needed to get a new coat. I needed to have a new encounter. I needed a new outpouring of his power. I needed to be clothed on high again. And the Bible says that every year Hannah would come. Isn't that exciting to know that wherever you're at, there's the expectation that the Holy Spirit is right around the corner about ready to do something new you can just be going through the motions of coming to church this morning thinking that it was just another day but in the Old Testament Hannah could have been around the corner and she had already prophetically said it's a new year and it's a new coat and it's a new season I came to tell somebody that if you're tired you're frustrated and you're constrained can I tell you the Holy Spirit sees where you're at and he's about to have a fresh encounter with you like never before. This church is getting ready for revival. This church is getting ready for an outpouring. These young people are not coming back the same way that they, you left them with. They are going to have an outpouring of God's spirit. They're not going to wear the coat of another generation. They're not going to wear the coat of yesterday. But the Holy Spirit wants to do something fresh and new in their life. If you believe it, say yeah. Yeah. Slap your neighbor and say, that's for you. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, so we got, we got overwhelmed, Samuel. We got constrained, Samuel. And somewhere in the middle, we got just right. Uh, uh, Pastor Al, I, I, I actually called uh, your team because I, 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 I'm in L.A., I, I'm trying to be hip and cool to that generation, so I like wear skinny jeans and, and long t-shirts and, and, and jackets that are shorter than the long t-shirts because any, any person knows if you want to reach the next generation, you got to have a longer shirt than your jacket. And, uh, uh, and so I got, all, I, I got all that, but I, I, I knew it was Sunday, so I, I needed to... Because I, I knew how good your pastor always dresses. Don't they always dress so sharp? 
look like off the cover of GQ magazine. And, and so I, I knew, I, need, I, I, I got the, the, the coat that actually matches the bottoms, which is a miracle for me because sometimes I don't see that and I, I get to church and I'm wearing the wrong things. But, but you can see the coat is perfect. And then I knew I was speaking in Fayetteville, so I wore the right socks the, the, uh, for our military honoring you. I, 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 I wore my camouflage and... and, and and, and as you can see, look, at, it's, it's perfect. It's like right at the right height. And I, I, can, look, I can lift up both hands. Can you lift up both hands? Barely. I, 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 and, and, and so it, it's, it's, it's perfect fit. Come on. Somebody say tailor-made. Yeah. So you've got overwhelmed and you've got constrained. But then there was somewhere along the way what Hannah was picturing, what Hannah was prophetic with. Yeah, she, she, she saw in her mind, not Samuel that I'm going to go meet, but to Samuel somewhere in the next year is going to look like this. I'm going to measure and cut out the coat for the maximum good. Is it going to be too big at times? Yes. Is it going to be too tight at times? Of course. It's for a full year. But there is a cycle. There is a window of opportunity that is what I would call the sweet spot. Maybe we could call it the favor of God. Maybe we could declare something like the Bible says do not grow weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not Uh, uh, so not only is there overwhelming not only is there constraining but I did come all the way from Los Angeles to tell somebody here that you're about to enter the sweet spot you're about to enter the favor of God and everything that God has said before is about to come to truth and is about to show fruition come on you've been going through hell you've been going through difficulties you've been wondering is this thing ever going to get better and the Holy Spirit says I saw before and I saw your future and you're about to arrive in your due season somebody here is about to walk in their due season somebody's about to walk in their divine appointment come on I don't know if it's your son coming back and giving his life to Jesus I don't know if it's a new job I don't know if it's a promotion but I believe somebody here is getting ready for their due season Come on, point to your neighbor and say, it's my time. Turn to your other neighbor and say, it's about time. Anybody believe it's their time, their season? Okay, okay. So we got, we got, we got overwhelmed. <laughs> We've got constrained, limited. We got divine season, due season, the, the, the right season. But I, I begin to continue to read the story of Samuel and his coats. And this wasn't the only time that Samuel's coat is actually mentioned in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 27 through 28, it says, As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and tore it. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one better than you. Young Samuel, you can go sit down. Come on, give it up for young Samuel. The Bible says that Saul (laughs) ripped the coat of Samuel. Give it up for older, mature muscles on the shoulder, Samuel. The Bible says that the coat and uh, if you read, uh, many of the Jewish historians and theologians believe that as, as, as Samuel grew, every year his mom continued to give him a coat until she died, something that she did. And so I don't, I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know exactly what, 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 what uh, you know, when we get to heaven, we can watch it on the Blu-ray, right? We can figure it out. But here's a story of Samuel wearing that coat, wearing a coat that his mother had made him. But Saul comes and tears the coat. And, and, and it's this period of, of mourning for Samuel because Samuel was so frustrated because he had, he had prayed for God to who he should anoint king and he anoints Saul. And now Saul is in a sense backsliding, doing his own thing, not going after God. And, and he's hurt. Anybody ever been hurt 
in church before. Come on, anybody ever been hurt? <laughs> Come on, anybody ever been hurt in life before? Anybody ever been hurt in church before? Come on, and if you have and it's the person next to you, don't point to them, but just move your eyebrows like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, how many of you ever been hurt before? I, I, so, so, Pastor Al, I didn't say this the second service, but my, my wife and I, so we moved to L.A., and I told, you know, one of the reasons why we were in L.A. was I, I was abandoned there, and my mom, biological mom, who I've never met personally in my life, I knew she lived in L.A., and I just had this, this like, I, I don't want to call it vision, but I had this dream that we would start this church, and she would come off the streets and get saved, and we just have that that Oprah moment, you know what I mean? It'd just be like uh, Oprah, and it would just be like, oh, oh, oh. you know, I saw it in my mind. And uh, 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 a few days before we moved into the building that we're in now, I get a Facebook message from my biological, I guess you would call it her, my aunt, my mother's sister, who I've never met, and uh, she said, Israel, uh, I just want you to know that your biological mom just died. And, um, and the reason why I'm contacting you is we've been following you and, and seeing that you moved to Redondo Beach. And what reminded us that you, that about you is her body right now is being cremated in Redondo Beach. And it was weird, like so close, yet so far. And so they asked me, would you do the funeral? So they asked me to do the funeral for the mom I've never met. Awkward. I mean, here I was picturing an Oprah moment. Man, it turned into Jerry Springer moment. Come on. And, 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 and. And I'll be honest with you, uh, I, I started asking about my mom, because, you know, when you do a funeral for somebody you don't know, you try to get stories so that you can weave them into the funeral and, and do all those. So, so I started asking, and I was, I was asking for a reason, like, you know, because it's my mom, who I've never met. And I start talking to her uh, and talking to the family and asking, and I find out she had a car. She had an iPhone. She had Facebook. Not once did she ever contact me. Not once did she, you know, and I'm thinking our selfies, are they not good enough? Are my kids not cute enough? Like, what do we need to do? We, we live in the city you end up dying in. And I have to tell you, I was a little hurt. I was a little ripped. I was in mourning a little bit. Like, how could we be so close yet so far? But you know what? The Holy Spirit began to do something in me that only the Holy Spirit can do. Is the Holy Spirit has the ability to begin to heal you of your past, to prepare you for your future. And the Bible says that Samuel's coat was ripped. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says God tells Samuel. Now picture it. Anytime you mourn, Anytime the Bible says somebody went into mourning, there's a couple things that would happen. They would have ashes put on them, and they'd also tear their coats. So I can just imagine and picture, I don't know, but I can just imagine Samuel in this torn coat that at one time was too big, one time constrained, now it's torn. And God shows up and he comes to Samuel and he says, Samuel, how long are you going to mourn? And then he begins to tell him to stop feeling bad and sorry about Saul and get ready to anoint a new king. And that new king was going to be David. And David was the one, come on, who got the, the, the Ark of the Covenant from Obed-Edom's home. He was the one that got the supplies for the temple. He was the one that, that on the side of the road, the young uh, blind man Bartimaeus said, Son of David, have mercy on me. David was one of the great kings in the history of Israel David was an incredible psalmist David was the future but Saul had to be in a way that hurt and that pain had to be dealt with and God tells Samuel how long are you going to mourn get your mind off of the hurts of yesterday and you better focus on tomorrow or you're going to miss out 
And can't you just picture Samuel saying, yeah, it was difficult. It was rough. It hurt. I'm not trying to cover up the pain of Saul or saying it didn't happen, but enough is enough. I'm taking off the ripped coat and I'm going to put on a new coat because I believe the mercies of God are new every day. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not saying that the pain did not happen. I'm not trying to say it hasn't been hurtful. What I'm saying is how long are you going to stick mourning with Saul when God says I've got something better for you in your future and your best is still yet to come. We've been hurt in church. We've been hurt as a society. We've been hurt in ethnicity groups. And, and, and you could look at me and go, you don't know nothing. You're, you're white and from L.A. Totally. I don't know. But I do know the principle of God that Saul had hurt Samuel and it hurt Samuel very bad. And Saul uh, uh, had lied and, 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 and done things that were wrong. And Samuel had to come to a point that somewhere along the way he could stay mad and he could stay angry and he could stay uh, the way he was or he could rise up and begin to say I'm the head and not the tail I'm above and not beneath I'm blessed in the city I'm blessed in the field and this tragedy and this pain and this hurt is not going to define my future because my future is brighter than my past and I came to tell somebody your future is better your best is yet to come you've got the call of God on your life come on if God be for you who can be against you You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Your past does not define your future. Come on, somebody. Your best is still yet to come. I'm going to close. If I could get somebody on the keyboard. If I could get somebody on the keyboard. You've been taking pictures the whole time. I haven't given you one good pose. Ready? One, two, three. Somebody's coming up on the keyboards and we're going to close with this. Some of you right now feel overwhelmed. I came to prophesy over you. The reason you're feeling overwhelmed is because God's got great purpose and destiny in your future. And he knows what you're facing now. And it's bigger than you because he wants you dependent on him. Just lift your hands right where you're at if that's you. You're overwhelmed. Holy Spirit, fill them right now. Holy Spirit, clothe them right now. Holy Spirit, empower them right now. Get them to the place that they know they're overwhelmed, but it's okay because you've got their future in their hands. Holy Spirit, second thing, you can put your hands down. If you'd say, today I'm constrained. I'm living off the fumes and the clothes of yesterday. I've had some great encounters with God. I've had some great moments. But just lately, it's stale. Lately. It's like I'm using the fuel of yesterday. And I believe that message today, that illustration of constraining, challenges me to say, Holy Spirit, I need, I need a fresh touch from you. I want you to just lift up your hands right where you're at. Right where you're at. Holy Spirit, pour down. Holy Spirit, pour down. Holy Spirit, fill them up. Fresh today. Yesterday was awesome, Holy Spirit, but we need you fresh this morning. And then some of you here this morning, you're ready for due season it resonated in you a prophetic word should never be a word that you've heard for the first time it should be something that resonates inside of you with the spirit of god uh, uh speaking the my spirit speaking to your spirit when i begin to say due season and i begin to talk about the process and i begin to talk about the difficulties something inside of you said yep your baby leapt uh, uh something leapt inside of you said yep i'm ready for that due season i'm i'm ready i feel it i feel it i know it put your hands up i want to pray for you right now favor of god favor of god grace zone like never before favor of god god i declare they have not grown weary in well-doing and in due season they will reap they will reap due season in the name of jesus last thing i'm going to close with this i'm going to hand it to your pastor i hope this doesn't offend him or we didn't talk about this but i felt the unction of the holy spirit that rip that torn you've been hurt Maybe you've been hurt in church. Maybe somebody looked over you. Maybe you were in a ministry and you felt like they they used you for your giftings. Uh, Maybe you're just life, difficulties, people around you, people at work, people in your family, and you're hurt today. You're hurt 
and you're still focused on yesterday instead of tomorrow. I feel like there's a moment. I feel like there's a holy moment. I feel like I, if I hope I can articulate this right, I believe in Christian counseling. I think it's incredible. But I believe one moment in the presence of God can do something so miraculous that what could have taken 10 years of counseling, God can do in a moment like this. And, and, and this is why I say that. This is why I say it. I'm doing my mom's funeral who I've never met. And God heals me while I'm doing the funeral. I, 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 like, like this, Holy Spirit comes in and I start doing a salvation call to the family I've never met. And they're raising their hands and their life is changing because God healed me. If God wouldn't have healed me, it would have been hard to talk about future when I was still sad with it.